Welcome back to the channel. My name is Mr. Eaton, and today we're going to be reading pages 226 to 238. Follow along if you would like to. My suggestion on this video is to uh, amp up the speed to 1.5. You'll get it done a lot faster than my slow butt can read. All right, I'm going to just jump into it. Kaya, off your phone. Hey, car, car. Here we go. Here we go. 226. As spring approaches, the day of Lori's graduation drew closer. I lay awake at night thinking about her life in New York City. In exactly three months, I'd say to her, you'll be leaving for New York. The following week, I said, in exactly two months and three weeks, you'll be leaving in for New York. Would you please shut up, she said. You'll, you're not nervous, are you, I asked. What do you think? Lori was terrified. She was not sure what she was supposed to do when she got into got to New York. The, that had always been the, the vaguest part of our escape plan. Back in the fall, I had no doubt that she could get a scholarship to one of the city's universities. She had, she'd been a finalist at the National Merit Scholarship, but she'd had to hitchhike in Bluefield to take the test. Then she got rattled when the trucker who picked her up put the moves on her. She arrived nearly an hour late and botched the test. Mom, who supported Lori's New York plans and kept saying she wished she were going to the big city herself, she just suggested that Lori apply to the Cooper Union Art School. Lori put together a portfolio of her drawings and paintings, but just before the submission deadline, excuse me, she spilled a pot of coffee on them, which made Mom wonder aloud if Lori had a fear of success. Excuse me. Then Lori heard about the scholarship sponsored by the Literary, yeah, Literary Society for the students who created the best work and the art inspired by one of the geniuses of the English language. She decided to make a clay bust of Shakespeare. She worked on it for a week using a sharpened popsicle, just popsicle sticks to shape the slightly bulging eyes and the goatee and earrings and longish hair. When it was finished, it looked exactly like Shakespeare. That night, we were all sitting at the drafting table watching Lori put the final touches on Shakespeare's hair when Dad came home drunk. That does indeed resemble old Billy, Dad said. Only thing is, as I have been telling you, he's a goddamn fake. For years, every time Mom brought up Shakespeare's plays, Dad would carry on about how they were written not by William Shakespeare of Avon, but by a bunch of people, including someone named the Earl of Oxford, because no single person in Elizabethan English could have had Shakespeare's 30,000 word vocabulary. All this bunk about little Billy Shakespeare, Dad would say, the great genius, despite his grammar school education, his small Latin and less Greek, was a lot of sentimental myth mythology. You're helping perpetuate this fraud, he told Lori. Dad, it's just a bust, Lori said. That's the problem, Dad said. He studied this sculpture, then suddenly reached over and smeared off Shakespeare's mouth with his thumb. What the hell are you doing? Lori cried out. It's no longer just a bust, Dad said. Now it has symbolic value. You can call it Mute Bard. I spent days on that, Lori shouted, and you've ruined it. I elevated it, Dad said. He told Lori he would help her write a paper that would demonstrate that Shakespeare's plays had multiple authors like Rembrandt's paintings. By God, you'll set the literary world on edge, he said. I don't want to set the world on edge, Lori screamed. I just want to win a stupid little scholarship. God damn it, you're in a horse race, but you're thinking like a sheep, Dad said. Sheep don't win horse races. Lori didn't have the spirit to rework the bust. The next day, she smushed the clay into a big glob and left it on the, the drafting table. I told Lori that if she hadn't been accepted into an art school by the time she graduated, she should go to New York anyway. She could support herself with the money we'd saved up until she found a job, and then she could apply to, to a school. That became our new plan. Everyone was mad at Dad, which gave him a case for the sulks. He said he didn't know what, why he even bothered to come home anymore, since he no longer got the slightest bit of appreciation for his ideas. He insisted he wasn't trying to keep Lori from leaving for New York, but if she had the sense that God gave a goose, she would stay put. New York is a sorry-ass sinkhole, he said more than once, filled with faggots and rapists. She'd get 
mugged and find herself on the streets, he warned, forced into prostitution and winding up a drug addict like all those runaway teenagers. I'm only telling you this because I love you, he said, and I don't want you to see I don't want to see you hurt. One evening in May, when we'd been sa been saving our money for almost nine months, I came home with a couple of dollars. I'd made babysitting and went to the bedroom to stash them in Oz. The pig was not on the old sewing machine. The pig was not on the old sewing machine. I began looking through all the junk in the bedroom and finally found Oz on the floor. Someone had slashed him apart with a knife and stolen all the money. I knew it was Dad, but at the same time, I couldn't believe he'd stooped this low. Lori obviously didn't know yet. She was in the living room, um, humming away as she worked out on a poster. My first impulse was to hide Oz. I had this wild thought that I could somehow replace the money before Lori discovered it was missing, but I knew how ridiculous that was. Three of us had spent the better part of a year accumulating the money. It would be impossible for me to replace it in a month before Lori graduated. I went to the living room and stood beside her, trying to think of a way to say it. She was working on a poster that said, Tammy, in day glow colors. After a moment, she looked up. What? She said. Lori could tell by my face that something was wrong. She stood up so abruptly, she knocked over a bottle of India ink and ran into the bedroom. I braced myself, expecting her to scream, but there was only silence and a small broken whimpering. Lori stayed up all night and to confront Dad, but he didn't come home. She skipped school the following day in case he returned, but Dad was AWOL for three days before he. we heard him climbing the rickety staircase to the porch. You bastard, Lori said. You stole our money. What the goddamn hell are you talking about, Dad, he said. And watch your language. He leaned against the door and lit a cigarette. Lori held up a slash pig and threw it as hard as he could at Dad, but it was empty and nearly weightless. It struck his shoulder lightly, then bounced to the floor. He bent down carefully, as if the floor beneath him could shift at any moment, picked up the, the ravaged pig, piggy bank, and turned it over on his hands. Someone sure as hell gutted old Oz, didn't they? He turned to me. Jeanette, do you know what happened? He was actually half grinning at me. After the whipping, Dad had jacked up the charm with me. Even though I was planning to leave, he could make me laugh when he tried, and he was still considered considered me an ally but now i wanted to knock him over the head you took our money i said that's what happened well don't don't that beat all dad said he started going on about how a man comes home from slaying dragons trying to keep his family safe and all he wants in return for his toils and sacrifices a little love and respect but it seems these days that was just too damn much to ask for he said he didn't take our new york money but if lori was hell-bent on living in a cesspool his finance he'd finance her trip himself he reached into the pocket and pulled out a few wadded dollar bills he just stared at him we just stared at him so he let the crumpled money fall to the floor suit yourself he said why are you doing this to us dad i asked why his face tightened with anger and then he staggered to the sofa bed and passed out I'll never get out of here, Lori kept saying. I'll never get out of here. You will, I say. I swear it. I believe she would, because I knew that if Lori never got out of Welsh, neither would I. I went back to G.C. Murphy the next day and stared at the shelf of piggy banks. They were all either plastic or porcelain or glass, easily broken. I studied a collection of metal boxes with locks and keys. The hinges were too flimsy. Dad could pry them apart. I bought a blue change purse. I wore on a, be uh, a belt under my clothes at all times. When I got too full, I put the money in a sock that I hid in a hole in the wall below my bunk. We started saving again, but Lori felt too defeated to paint to paint much, and the money didn't come as quickly. A week before school was out, we had only thirty-seven dollars and twenty cents in the sock. Then one of the woman I'd been babysitting for, a teacher named Mrs. Sanders, told me she and her family were moving back to their hometown in Iowa and asked if I wanted to spend the summer with them there. If I came along and helped look after her two toddlers, she said she'd pay me $200 at the end of the summer and buy me a bus ticket back to Welsh. I thought about it. I've thought about her offer. Take Lori instead of me, I said, and at that end of the summer, buy her a bus ticket to New York City. Mrs. Sanders agreed. Low-lying 
uh, pewter colored clouds rested on the mountaintops around Welsh on the morning of Rory's departure. There were, they were there most mornings, and when I noticed them, they reminded me of how isolated and forgotten the town was, a sad, lost place adrift in the clouds. The clouds usually burned away my mid-morning, uh, away by mid-morning, when the sun climbed above the steep hills. But some days, like the one, like the one Lori left, they clung to the mountains, and a fine mist formed into the valley that turned your hair and face damp. But the Sanders family pulled up in the station wagon. Lori was ready. She had packed her clothes, her favorite ba books, and her art supplies in a single cardboard box. She hugged all of us except Dad. She had refused to speak to him since he plun plundered Oz, promised to write, and climbed into the station wagon. We all stood watching as the car disappeared down Little Hobart Street. Lori never once looked back. I took, I took that as a good sign. When I climbed the staircase to the house, Dad was standing on the porch smoking a cigarette. Hmm, this family's falling apart, he said. It sure is, I told him. That night, when I was going into the 10th grade, Miss Bevins made me news editor of the Maroon Wave. After working as a proofreader in the 7th grade, I started laying out pages in the 8th grade. In the 9th grade, I began reporting and writing articles and taking photographs. Mom had bought a Minolta camera to take pictures of her pictures so she could send them to Lori, who could show them around the art galleries in New York. When Mom wasn't using it, I wore the Minolta everywhere, because you never know when you'd see something newsworthy. What I loved about calling myself a reporter was that it gave me an excuse to show up any place. Since I'd never made lots of friends in Welsh, I hardly ever went to the school's football games or dances or rallies. I felt awkward sitting by myself when everyone else was with friends, but when I was working for the Wave, I had reason to be there. I was on assignment. I remember uh, I was a member of the working press with my notepad in hand and the Minolta around my neck. I began going to just about ever, every extracurricular event at the school, and the kids who shunned me before now accepted me. They even sought me out, posing and clowning in hopes of getting their picture in the paper. As someone who could make them famous among their peers, I was no longer a person to be traveled with. Even though the wave could only came out only once a month, I worked on it every day. Instead of hiding in the bathroom during lunch hour, I spent it in Miss Biven's classroom where I wrote my articles, edited the stories written by other students, and counted the letters and headlines to make sure they fit in the columns. I finally had a good excuse for why I never ate lunch. I'm on a deadline, I'd say. I also stayed after school to develop my photographs in the dark room that they had given, and that had a, a hidden benefit. I could sneak into the cafeteria once everyone had left, dig through the garbage pails. I'd find industrialized cans of corn that were nearly full and huge containers of coleslaw and tapioca pudding. I no longer had to root through the bathroom waste packets for food, and I hardly ever went hungry again. When I was a janitor, when I was a janitor, Miss Bivens made me the editor in chief. Now the job was supposed to go to the senior. Only a handful of students wanted to work at the Wave, and I ended up writing so many of the articles that I have abolished bylines. It looked a little ridiculous having my name appear four times on the front page. The paper cost 15 cents and I sold it myself, going from class to class and standing in the hallways, hawking in like a newsboy. Welsh High had about 1,200 students, but we sold only a couple hundred copies of the paper. I tried various schemes to boost circulation. I held poetry co competitions, added a fashion column, and wrote controversial editorials, including one questioning the validity of standardized tests, which provoked an irate letter from the head of the State Department of Education. Nothing worked. One day, a student I was trying to get to buy a wave told me he had no use for it because the same names appeared on the paper again and again, the school's athletes, the cheerleaders, and the handful of kids known as Slide Rules, who always won the academic prizes. So I started a column called Birthday Corner, listing the names of the 80 or so people who had their birthday in the column coming month. Most of these people had never appeared in the paper, and they were so excited to see their name in print that they bought several copies. Circulation doubled. Miss Bivens wondered about 
I thought a birthday corner represented serious journalism. I told her I didn't care. It sold papers. Chuck Yeager visited Wil uh, Welsh High that year. I'd been hearing about Chuck Yeager all my life from Dad, and about how he'd been born in West Virginia, in the town of Myra and the Mud Rivers over in Lincoln County. About how he joined the Air Force during World War II and had shot down 11 German planes by the time he was 22. And how he became the test pilot for Edwards Air Force Base high up on the Mojave De uh, the, uh, the Mahoe Desert of um, California. And about how one day in 1947 he became the first man to break the sound barrier in his X-1. Even though the night before he'd been drinking and had been thrown from a horse and cracked some ribs. Dead would never admit to having heroes, but the brass, bald, liquor-loving, coolly calculated Chuck Yeager was the one man he would have admired above all others. When he heard that Chuck Yeager was giving a speech at Welsh High and that he'd agreed to let me interview him afterwards, Dad could hardly contain his excitement. He was waiting on the porch for me with a pen and paper when I got home from school the day before the big interview. He sat down to help me draw up a list of in intellectual question or intelligent questions so I wouldn't embarrass myself in front of the greatest of West Virginia's native sons. What was going through your head when you first broke Mark Mach 1? What was going through your head when A. Scott Crossford broke Mach 2? What is your favorite aircraft? What are your thoughts about the feasibility of flying at the speed of light? feasibility um dad wrote about what are your thoughts on the feasibility of flying at the speed of light dad wrote up about 25 or 30 questions like that and then insisted we rehearse the interview he pretended to be chuck yeager and gave me detailed answers to the questions he'd written out his eyes got misty as he described what it was like to break the sound barrier then he decided i needed some solid grounding in aviation history and he stayed up half the night briefing me by the light of the kerosene lamp and the testing and the test flight program basic aerodynamics and the Aust austrian physic physicist Ern ernst Mach. can you stop the next day mr jack the principal introduced chuck yeager during assembly in the auditorium he looked more like a cowboy than a west virginian with his horseman's gait and his lean leathery face but as soon as he started speaking, his voice was pure up hollow. As he talked, the fidgety students settled into their folding chairs and became enraptured by the legendary well-traveled man who told us how proud he was of his West Virginian roots and how we, too, should be proud of the roots, roots we all shared, and how regardless of how he came from or where he came from, each and every one of us could sh should follow our dreams just as he followed his. When you finish talking, the applause about shatter the glass in the windows. I climbed up on the stage before the students filed out. Mr. Yeager, I said, holding out my hands. I'm Jeanette Walls with the Marine Wave. Chuck Yeager took my hand and read, Jess, spell my name right, ma'am, he said, so my kin will know who you're writing about. We sat down on some folding chairs and took for near talked for nearly an hour. Mr. Yeager took every question seriously and acted like he he had all the time in the world for me. When I mentioned various art uh, aircraft he'd flown, the aircraft dad had briefed me about, he grinned again and said, heck, I do believe we got an aviation expert on our hands. In the hallways afterwards, the other kids kept coming up to, up to tell me how lucky I was. What was he really like, they asked. What did he say? Everyone treated me with the the difference accorded only to the school's top athletes. Even the varsity quarterback caught my eye and nodded. I was the girl who actually talked to Chuck Yeager. Excuse me, Dad was so eager to hear about the interview, hear how the interview went, that he was not only home when I got back from school, he was even sober. He insisted on helping me with the article to ensure its technical accuracy. I already had... I already had a lead figure out, figured out in my head. I sat down in front of Mom's uh, Remington and typed it out. The pages of the history books came alive this month when Chuck Yeager, the man who first broke the sound barrier, visited Welch High. Dad looked over my shoulders. Great, he said, but let's juice it up just a little bit. 30 
Indeed, right? Yep, there we go. Moving on. Lori had been writing to us regularly from New York. She loved it there. She was living in a hotel for women in the Green Welch Village, working as a waitress in a German restaurant, and talking art classes and even fencing lessons. She met the most fascinating group of people, every one of them a weird genius. People in New York loved art and music so much, she said, that artists sold paintings right on the sidewalk next to a string quartet playing Mozart. Even Central Park wasn't as dangerous as people in West Virginia, West Virginia thought. One of the weekends, it was filled with roller coasters and frisbee players and jugglers and mimes with their face painted white. She knew I'd love it once I got there. I knew it too. Ever since I started 11th grade, I've been counting off the months, 22 of them, until I would join Lori. I had my plans worked out. Once I had graduated from high school, I'd move to New York, enroll at a city college, and then get a job at the AP or UPI and wire services whose stories unspooled from the Welsh Daily News uh, teletype machines or with one of the famous news New York papers. I'd overhear the reporters at the Welsh Daily News make jokes to one another about the the high flaunt writers who worked at those papers and I was determined to become one. In the middle of my junior year I went to Miss K Katana, the high school guidance counselor, to ask for the names of the college in New York. Miss Katana lifted the glasses that dangled from a cord around her neck and peered at me through them. Bluefield State was only 36 miles away, she said. And with my grades, I could probably get a full scholarship. I want to go to a college in New York, I said. Miss Katana gave me a puzzled frown. Whatever for. That's where I want to live. Miss Katana said that, in her view, this was a bad idea. It was easier to go to a college in the state where you had, uh, had attended high school. You were considered in-state, which meant acceptance was more likely and tuition was cheaper. I thought about this for a minute. Maybe I should move to New York City right now and graduate from high school there. Then I'll be considered in-state. Miss Katana squinted at me. But you live here, she said. This is your home. Miss Katana was a fine-boned woman who always wore button-up sweaters and stout shoes. She had gone to Welch High School, and it seemed not to have occurred to her to live anywhere else. To leave West Virginia, even to leave Welch, would have been un unthinkably disloyal, like deserting your family. Just because I live here now, I said, doesn't mean I couldn't move. That would be a terrible mistake. You live here. Think of what you'd miss, your family, your friends. And senior year is the highlight of your entire high school experience. You'd miss senior day. You'd miss the senior prom. I walked home slowly that evening, thinking over what Miss Katana had said. It was true that many grown-ups in Welch talked over about their senior year in high school as the highlight of their lives. On senior day, something the school had set up to keep juniors from dropping out, the seniors wore funny clothes or and got to skip classes. It was not exactly a compelling reason to stay in Welsh for one more year. As for the senior prom, prom, I had about as much chance of getting a date as Dad did of ending corruption in the unions. I had been speaking hypothetically about moving to New York a year earlier, a year early. But as I walked, I realized that if I wanted to, I could up and go. I could really do it. Maybe not right now, not this minute. It was the middle of the school year, but I could wait until I finished 11th grade, but then I'd be 17. I had almost $100 saved, enough to get me started in New York. I could leave Welch in under five months. I got so excited that I started running. I ran faster and faster along the old road, overhung with bare branch trees, then on the grand view and up on Little Hobart Street, past the barking yard dogs and the frost covered coal piles past the Nova's house and the Parish's house and the Halls' house and the Rinko's house until gasping for air I came to a stop in front of our house for the first time in years I noticed my half-finished yellow paint job I'd spent so much time in Welch trying to make things a little bit better but nothing had worked in fact the house was getting worse one of the supporting pillars was starting to buckle the leak in the roof over Brian's bed had gotten so bad that when it rained he slept under an inflatable raft. Mom had won in a sweepstake by sending in Benson and Hedges 100 packages we dug from trash cans. 
If I left, Brian could have my own bed. My mind was made up. I was going to New York City as soon as the school year was out. I had clambered up the mountains, mountainside to the rear of the house. The stairs had completely rotten through and climbed through the back window we now used as a door. Dad was on the drafting table working on some calculations and Mom was, uh, was going through her stacks of paintings. When I told them about my plan, Dad stubbed out his cigarette, stood up and climbed out of the back window without saying a word. Mom nodded and looked down, dusting off her old paintings, murmuring something to herself. So what do you think? I said, fine, go. What's wrong? Nothing. You should go. It's a good plan. She seemed on the verge of tears. Don't be sad, Mom. All right. I'm not upset because I'll miss you, Mom said. I'm upset because you get to go to New York and I'm stuck here. That's not fair. Lori, when I called her, approved of my plan. I could live with her, she said, if I got a job and chipped in on rent. Brian liked my idea, too, especially when I pointed out that he could have my bed. He began making wisecracks and a, and a lockjaw accent about how I was going to become one of those fur-wearing, pink-extending, nose-in-the-air New Yorkers. He began counting down the weeks until I left, just as I had counted them down for Lori. In 16 weeks, you'll be in New York, he said. The next week, in three months, in three weeks, you'll be in New York. Dad had barely spoken to me since I announced my decision. One night that spring, he came into the bedroom where I was on the on my bunk studying. He had some papers rolled up under his arm. Got a minute to look at something? I asked. He asked. Sure. I followed him into the living room where he had spread the papers on the drafting table. They were his old blueprints for the glass castle, castle all stained and dog earned. I couldn't remember the last time I had seen them. We stopped talking about the glass castle once the foundation we dug was filled with garbage. I think I finally worked out how to deal with the lack of sunlight on the hillside, Dad said. And it involved installing specially curved mirrors in the solar cells. But what he wanted to talk to me about was my plans for my room. Now that Lori's gone, he said, I'm reconfiguring the layout and your room will be a lot bigger. Dad's hand trembled slightly as he rolled different blueprints. He had drawn frontal views, side views, and aerial views of the glass castle. He had diagrammed the wiring and the plumbing. He had drawn the interiors of rooms and labeled them and specified their dimensions down to the inches in the precise blocky handwriting. I stared at the plans. Dad, I said, you'll never build the glass castle. Are you saying you don't have faith in your old man? Even if you do, I'll be gone. In less than three months, I'm leaving for New York City. What I was thinking was, you don't have to go right away, Dad said. I could stay and graduate from Welch High and go to Blue State, as Miss Katona had suggested, then get a job at the Welch Daily News. He'd help me with the articles like he helped me with the piece on Chuck Yeager. And I'll build the glass castle, I swear it. We'll all live in it together, and it'll be hell of a lot better than the apartments you'll ever find in New York City. I can guarantee goddamn tea it. Dad, I said, as soon as I finish classes, I'm getting on the next bus out of here. If the buses stop running, I'll hitchhike. I'll walk if I have to. Go ahead and build the glass castle, but don't do it for me. Dad rolled up the blueprints and walked out of the room. A minute later, I heard him scrambling down the mountainside. What a somber end to another day. Day two of quarantine. I hope all of you have a great day. Please go ahead and like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And uh, click that bell icon for all future videos. You never know, there might be some answers to questions. Well, anyways, this has been your favorite English teacher, Mr. Eaton, signing out.